wisdom, prudentia, justice, justicia, temperance, temperantia, courage, fortitudo. Applying ancient philosophy to modern life, this is the Sunday Stoic. Welcome to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. This is Steve, and today it is my great pleasure to interview Karen Duffy, the author of Backbone, Living with Chronic Pain Without Turning Into One. Karen has been an MTV VJ model. She's been in several films, but was diagnosed in the mid-90s with sarcoidosis, a disease that has left her in chronic pain. We'll talk a bit about her career, about sarcoidosis, and how she uses non-monumental moments of happiness, as well as the service of others, to thrive in the face of chronic pain. Today's guest is our first bona fide celebrity, unless you count Donald Robertson. <laughs> Karen, Karen <laughs> Duffy is, well, let me just leave it to you, Duff. You have had quite a career. Uh, you've been a model, an MTV mm -hmm. VJ. You've acted in several films, including my brother's favorite film. Can you guess what that might be? Uh, Dumb and Dumber? You are correct. <laughs> um, I and and you're a hockey mom as well, is that correct? Yes, I am. Uh, and um, well, and, and I just want to say thank you very much for having me on. And um, Steve, you and I, and you're, uh, you and I are united in the fact that we look at at Donald Robertson as a celebrity. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, thank you so much for having me on. And um, I've really been enjoying listening to your podcast. It's wow. Been, such a bright light in the morning when I get up and take, go for a walk and to, you know, hear the way you're able to take such kind of complicated ideas and have them in such clarity. You really have a gift for that. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I don't know if my students will agree with you. We, we've been covering photosynthesis this week. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a complicated topic in its own right. But you're I also know. an author. Uh, yes. Uh, You've written a book, uh, Model Patient, My Life as an Incurable Wise-Ass, and Backbone, mm -hmm. Living with Chronic Pain Without Turning into One. You also have a book on cooking, don't you? Yes, I do, called The Slob in the Kitchen. And um, and it's funny, I think for each of the books that I've written, Model Patient, uh, which was my first book, uh, I really wanted to kind of explain what it was like, as we discussed earlier, like... Um, I was very fortunate uh, as a young woman living in New York City. I was able to, I actually started my career as a recreational therapist working in a nursing home. And I loved it. I'd been volunteering at a nursing home since I was about 12 years old. And I went to college and got my degree and postgrad in recreational therapy. And I moved back home to New York City and was working at the nursing home where uh, I began as a volunteer when I was 12. And uh, my experiences working with a geriatric population where my elocution had to be on point and I had to learn skills and techniques so that people with dementia and, and low attention spans would be able to pay attention to me. Hmm. And when I started modeling, I was like, okay, I think this is, I kind of felt like I snuck into a party and I was going to get kicked out. I figured, well, what has a little bit of longevity? And MTV was right in New York City. And I sent in a uh, audition tape. And what was interesting is that all the skills that I used in the nursing home, like actually made me a better MTV VJ. And at that point, everyone was saying that VJs were MTV was uh, diminishing people's attention spans. Um, so I think my goal with every book that I write or every, you know, every essay and article is to kind of explain, maybe I'm, I'm figuring out things in my head and then, uh, figure, then kind of publishing it and put it in the world. Well, I'd say there's an important lesson there. You, you never know uh, how the skills you're learning now will be applied later. Uh, in new exactly, projects. exactly. I believe that all skills are transferable. 
And like you said to your students who are learning photosynthesis, <laughs> this will be an unbelievable wealth of knowledge when you're having dinner over a salad or, you know, you're walking through a garden and uh, or through a forest, you know, just to remember that um, I try and take every opportunity to be less stupid. And I think that that is what I've learned from all of the books that I've uh, written is I am just trying to make myself less stupid. And I love to fill it with like crazy every page. I want to have a fact and a laugh on every page. That's an excellent motto, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I I feel the same way. I try to uh, read when I can, but also get away from uh, screens and get out into the woods and and uh, and just decompress as well is very important. You know, it's it's interesting. Um, uh, my son, as I'm a hockey mom, my son uh, plays hockey up at a, a boarding school in Connecticut, and it's in the Berkshire Mountains. And what's really interesting, as a teenager, he does not have the dependence on a cell phone because they don't get reception up there. <laughs> so it's this unbelievable gift. And when we're together in New York, you know, he said, I'm just, he just, he's, he said it kind of an interesting quote. He said, you know, I just find that being that a cell phone can be infantilizing and somewhat neutering. And that if I'm attached to your digital ap apron strings all the time, how am I going to learn to be a man? And I was like, wow, like, it's amazing that when, you know, you put some intellectual firepower behind it, you can really, you know, a, a small idea of the fact that, you know, cell phone service is unreliable has now opened up this idea to him that, you know, maybe he's better off. Yeah, exactly. As we have found out this morning, Skype can be unreliable as well. Exactly. I know. Well, you know, I think that... um uh, Aristotle said, the problem is we don't expect that there will be problems. <laughs> and, uh, I think that that is so true, especially dealing with technology. What's really, it, it, I do find it infantilizing because when, uh, I can't, like when I, uh, couldn't get connected to you, I did feel like somewhat panicked and, like I think I, I almost reverted back about a few decades to a, like a child. Like I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got to get this done. It <laughs> felt like I was taking a math test. Like a, right. I gave myself like this surge of anxiety because I couldn't connect with you. And uh, I think that uh, you know that's that's an interesting thing. And and I think what I what we share with our admiration for the Stoics is that we can kind of step back and look at our behavior. And usually, it's usually pretty funny. <laughs> You're right. Yes. And I'm so glad we did get connected and I, I heartily welcome you to the podcast. Thank you very much. I look forward to uh, listening to many more Sunday Stoics. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, get in uh, our, our DeLorean here and go back in time for a moment uh, mm -hmm. to the, uh, the mid to early, or was it the uh, mid nineties when, when uh, you first started noticing the uh, the the symptoms that we're we're going to talk a little bit about. You know, it's interesting. Um, yes, uh, uh, I live with a condition called sarcoidosis of the central nervous system, and yes, I was in my early thirties when I started noticing it around ninety five, ninety six, and I'm, to the point where I noticed it where I could not. Uh, I could no longer function and actually went into the hospital. Wow. And I think prior to that, looking back over the course of years, there may have been, you know, smaller symptoms that I just kind of thought, oh, these will resolve. But um, what happened was uh, I have um, a disease, sarcoidosis, in my central nervous system. And um, what sarcoidosis does is um, – it is an autoimmune uh, inf inflammatory disease of unknown origin. It's actually an orphan disease. And it's the cells in your body, and it can attack any cell or system in your body that has soft tissue. Hmm. So brain, skin, lung, organ tissue, anywhere except 
bones and teeth. Wow. Um, so I have it in my brain. And as this granuloma, they're not tumors, they're called granulomas mm-hmm. because they are like crystals, uh, grew so large um, that it pressed on the nerves because, and your skull is a contained environment, that it just destroyed all these nerves in my brain and spinal column, which uh, impacts uh, my the feeling. I have no feeling in my hands or feet, which is why dealing with a telephone is very difficult I for me uh, because when you don't have any feeling, the touch tones don't work. Sure. So I've been living with sarcoidosis uh, for about uh, about 20 years now. So what was life like as you, you know, what, what were you, what were you doing at the time? Were you, were you uh, on TV at that time? What, what was life like? Yes. Uh, when I got sick, it was, um, I was uh, working at MTV as a VJ and uh, I was in movies, uh, your brother's um, favorite movie, <laughs> uh, Dumb and Dumber and several uh, Woody Allen films. And uh, I was working on a television show with uh, uh, Michael Moore called TV Nation. Right. And uh, so I kind of felt like I was really at like... Of, I was things were really coming together for me, um, and uh, like most things, you know, you can't plan when you're going to have a major health crisis. You know, it's it's really interesting. Um, uh, when I first got sick, I actually was at the Emmy Awards, oh, and wow. um, that was on a Sunday night, and uh, I was with a buddy of mine uh, who uh, won, and I and I was like, wow, like my head is really hurting. Did we drink champagne? I mean, did we drink champagne? I just don't get it. And Mm. he was like, no, no. And so the next morning, uh, I flew from LA back to New York city and went right to the doctors, right from the airport. And he took one look at me and, uh, sent me right to the hospital. Uh So it was kind of crazy how there are all these photos of me uh, as a young woman with George Clooney at the Emmys. And I literally like, like got on the first plane after that event, flew to New York and my life kind of as my old life ended and a whole new life began. And uh, so it's been, uh, it's, you know, it's been really interesting uh, because at that point in my career, it felt like I was had just built a plane, built it by hand, mm-hmm. and I was ready to take it off. And right when I was ready to fly it, I had to actually put it back uh, into the hangar on the tarmac and uh, take care of my physical body. Uh, and that took about seven years. I would imagine that comes with not only the hardship of dealing with the physical pain, but then the disappointment and the emotional uh, uncertainty and pain of, of, of being pretty sure where you were going. And then suddenly as they, as Marcus Aurelius might say, uh, you have an obstacle (laughs) and trying to make the obstacle become the way, like, what do I do now? Uh, That must be very difficult. Well, you know, I think uh, when you have no other option, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was on chemo for many years and what happened was I was a model and I would say that chemotherapy and steroids are no beauty treatment. Mm. And so what I was making most of my money on, which was my outward, what I looked like, um, that, that was already good. That was always hanging on by a thread, (laughs) but, um, uh, but, you know, getting sick, losing my hair, getting a hunchback, <laughs> getting uh, what's called Cushing syndrome when you take steroids and your face kind of puffs up like a football. Um, I really couldn't, you know, do any of that. And I wanted to come clean to Revlon. And uh, I was the Charlie girl in the face for Almec cosmetics. And I was like, listen, I am not the person you hired. And uh, so I just want you to know I won't be able to kind of fulfill the contract. And what was amazing in that moment of honesty where everybody told me not to tell and just take as much money as I could from Revlon, um, uh, the company was like, 
you know, we hired you for inner beauty, which is an interesting thing for a cosmetics company to say. I'd say and so. uh, they kept me on for another 10 years wow. as a spokeswoman about uh, women's health care. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, so that was an honesty was an upside, but I think, you know, it's true when we lose something, we often have to find, you know, find something else. And I was able to, uh, kind of go back to my, uh, interest in stoicism. Uh, when I was sick, I think the book that I read the most was Meditations uh, by Marcus Aurelius and Viktor Frankl. Um, And uh, those were my two constant companions that gave me the strength to say, no matter what, I'm going to be okay with this. Right. How how did you first find uh, Marcus Aurelius and the Stoics? How did you discover Um, them? You know, it was interesting because uh, I've always been a big reader. um, And... uh, Someone gave me a um, collection. They were called from the Penguin uh, imprint, Mm -hmm. and they were called Penguin 50 Ps. They were Penguin 50 Pence. And Penguin released hundreds of these uh, small classics that could fit in your pocket. And the idea was that you could read it on the subway. Um, And uh, so I got an entire collection of the classics. And... uh, I just started keeping them in my bag and just reading them. And when I got to Marcus Aurelius, uh, it was like every synapse was firing. And I was like, oh, I get this, (laughs) which then led me to possibly my favorite book in the Stoic canon, which is by Epictetus, Mm -hmm. uh, The Art of Living, Uh, and I would say Epictetus is my main man. That yeah, is, is that the uh, the? I think I'm familiar with that that translation. It's a it's a very good read. Uh, I've yes, it's the interpretation uh, by Sharon Labelle. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I, yes. I've I've found it very very readable and so so much uh, so accessible that I've I've given it as uh, as presents. <laughs> That's that's funny. You know, I have actually um, uh, I love this Sharon LaBelle edition so much. And I have uh, the original Epictetus ones. And um, but I will tell you that I buy this book like by the tens. When I go to the Strand bookstores, one of uh, our country's best bookstores, and they have four miles of books. And I just go into the philosophy section and I will just buy 10 copies of this hmm. because it is such a book that is that I think that is accessible to everyone. Each page just has a handful of sentences, but the clarity of um, Sharon LaBelle uh, interpreting Epictetus is just incredible. You know, it was, it was funny the other day I uh, met with Rob, uh, Donald Robertson and Massimo Pugliacci. Uh, uh, I met Donald uh, for lunch and we were talking about our love for Epictetus. And do you know what that name Epictetus means? Something like acquired one or something, isn't yes. it? Yes. And so we were debating, good job, Steve. We were debating <laughs> whether or not his name was Epictetus acquired because he was a slave and was acquired or because of the knowledge he mm. acquired. And I would say it was a draw. <laughs> I'm, that would be interesting to have a, a one-on-one with uh, Donald and uh, Massimo. That that's uh, that's pretty cool. I thought about yeah, it was really cool. I, I thought about trying to uh, beg my patrons to help send me to Greece for Stoicon so I could uh, hang out there, but uh, I decided to uh, stay here and uh, and and teach instead. <laughs> Well, you know what? Like, I'm, I'm thinking about going next year, and um, we're thinking about doing one in New York. Um, and uh, uh, so possibly we can get you to New York, which may be a, a little bit easier. Yeah, that would be. That would be. Yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> so we'll sell Girl Scout cookies. Uh, we'll find some, some way to get you on a Greyhound. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there. We'll, we'll sell uh, Marcus Aurelius <laughs> cookies or something yeah <laughs> yeah we could we, we could sell the um uh the art of living books there you go there you go yeah we'll just mm-hmm. mark them up a little bit and uh 
Yeah, I think this could work. This could work. <laughs> yes. So let's go to the present. You know, for those of us who don't can't fully grasp, you know, I feel here's I know a guy who who was uh, in the Korean War and the Vietnam War. OK, and he talks mm -hmm. about things he saw and I sit at his feet going, oh, my gosh, but I can never understand what it was like. And I feel the same thing with chronic pain. I know what pain is, but having chronic pain so far in my life, I've not experienced. Could, what? How well are you able to to keep it under control, pharmaceutically speaking? Let's start there. Well, um, you know, it, it's interesting. I think we all, you know, we, we have a, an idea of what pain is, but chronic pain is, there's a saying that there's pain that hurts you and pain that changes you. Hmm. And chronic pain changes you. Um, and the word chronic comes from the Greek chronos, meaning time. So acute pain, and that comes from acute, meaning sharp. Acute pain is an injury where, there, um, where it's a broken bone or tissue damage, a burn, something that's usually visible. And it lasts any, you know, it lasts up until three months. Chronic pain goes from three months to perpetuity. And the idea is that uh, t chronic pain is essentially timeless. It has no end. And um, so I take uh, heavy uh, prescriptions. I take uh, morphine and I wear a pain patch, um, a lidocaine uh, patch on my neck just to kind of calm the nerves because what's happening is this large granuloma has destroyed the nerves uh, and my body's constantly sending a signal like there's a problem here. So it's wow. constantly, it's constantly setting this alarm. And uh, one night I was out to dinner and I was wearing my pain patch. And uh, this, uh, this guy I'd never met before said, you know, what's that patch for? And I said, well, I live with chronic pain. And he said, well, what's it like? And we were out in the countryside in the Berkshires and there were mosquitoes flying. And I was like, well, you know, when you get a mosquito bite, and it itches, so you scratch it. And so when you scratch it, you are essentially distracting yourself from the itch with the low level pain mm -hmm. of the scratch. And I think when you live in chronic pain for every minute of your life, I am always looking for low level happiness, low level ways to make my life more meaningful more joyful. And, uh, and that's, that's the way I manage it. And that's the way I live with it. So what are some of those everyday low level happiness events that, that help you along? <laughs> well, for instance, I love drinking tea. Uh, I love reading. Um, I feel when you live with, uh, we all, live with um we never know when our last day will be right. but i think when you live with chronic pain and you have a good enough day where you can actually put on shoes and go out in the world i really try and make it count mm -hmm. and um i really believe in the quality of what what i call it non-monumental moments of happiness these non-monumental exchanges like i just had to run down because i my i have neuropathy in my hands and i can't operate my new um my new cell phone, my new iPhone. So I had to go run down to the doorman and ask him if he could please um, type in your number. Um, and, you know, I just thanked him and just ran up. And so my life is full of these tiny moments where I say good morning to the fruit vendor. I have a relationship. I, when I walk my dog, of all the people that I stop and say hello with, um, there's a homeless lady who lives downstairs on the street and I bring her clothes and food and coffee and you know, I just try and uh, really get, feel like I am present and that I can maybe give something um, of myself uh, because I feel that that is what gives my life purpose and meaning. So cultivating gratitude would be a, a big part of that. Oh, absolutely. And it was interesting. I heard um, Vice President Joe Biden speak um, 
my friend uh, lost a child in the Sandy Hook massacre. Oh my goodness. And uh, she has become a real agent for change. Mm-hmm. And uh, Vice President Biden spoke at this dinner and he spoke about purpose. And he said, in life, we need our purpose. And in finding our purpose, that is having something to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. And I thought, well, that certainly makes finding your purpose seem a lot easier when you just break it down into three steps. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes that simplicity is profound. <laughs> yes. Um, something just popped into my head. Uh, speaking of gratitude and the people around us that we can be thankful for, before I forget, my friend John was a big MTV fan back in the day, and he says hi. Oh, okay. Well, please send your friend John my very best. I will. He'll. There you go. That now his day is made. As is mine. That's nice to hear. I've got to say it is. It is nice to hear um, because I have a son and. Like when I'm walking around with him, he's like, how do all these people know you? And I was like, well, you know, I was like, he's like, but MTV doesn't really exist. Like he just has no idea what a VJ would be as (laughs) the video jockey has gone the way of the buggy whip maker. But what's funny is, um, uh, you know, I guess when we were working there, we all thought it was limitless. You know, we thought, oh, this is going to go on forever. No. And, but all of the tapes that we taped um, our shows on, we just re use them over and over again. <laughs> oh, so there is really, there is n- no real evidence of me having ever been on MTV. Well, it's much like the Stoics. We only have a few writings of the Stoics left from a once great library of, of thought. And now we're, we're down to what's left. And I guess that makes us cherish what's left all the better. <laughs> but also, yes, exactly. But also what I love, too, about um, the, uh, Stoicism is, uh, you know, people like you and Massimo, Donald, Ryan Holiday, uh, Dr. Sharon LaBelle, um, there, that there is such modernism encapsulated in this ancient uh, school of wisdom. And I love that it's really... Uh, it's 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 electrifying to see people, you know, t- attending the modern Stoics conferences. And um, I went to a conference that that Massimo was speaking at at the School of Ethical Culture, and it was standing room only. And um, why do you think now it is being so uh, there's having such a moment in Stoicism? I wonder if it's just the the fact that. Maybe it's always been this way, but things feel uncertain (laughs) and Mm -hmm. finding a a coping mechanism, perhaps. But one thing I found interesting, though, is people have been practicing Stoicism forever. A lot of Mm -hmm. well-known people were were very much influenced by them. It's just it wasn't necessarily – talked about in the in the direct way we do now uh with a podcast for example uh you know teddy roosevelt Mm -hmm. and many many athletes and and things have have utilized this philosophy but now it's spilling the banks into the public at large and uh and uh perhaps perhaps uh perhaps it is that uncertainty uh the feeling of a loss of control and and an overwhelm of information and an overwhelm of of political uncertainty that that's that's we can find solace in this uh this this fortification that is stoicism perhaps yes i think there's a real comfort in the simplicity and that it it is uh it it is illuminating because it's so relatable yeah it's as you said it's so modern for being so old when you read it, it you can relate to it immediately Yes, I like it. And I also love like it's, you know, focuses on like, you know, on virtues, happiness, uh, moral courage. And um, those are all components of you know, what I hope to accomplish in my life. And um, I think uh, that uh, it is, ideas don't count. 
unless you take action. Sure. And what I love about stoicism is that like you can act immediately to, um, you know, take steps to be, live a more morally awakened, vigorous life. And you're encouraged to, uh, why put off tomorrow the good that you could do now? Yes. And, and so you do that, you, you're you cultivating uh, gratitude and enjoying perhaps mindfully your, your tea and, and thankful for those around you and you're helping people around you. And I think that that's, that's a huge part. You know, um, my, I had a cousin who was a New York City police officer and uh, he uh, he was killed on the job. Um, there, were, there were 28 people being held hostage. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, my cousin um, was, you know, put his life on the line and died and, uh, and was murdered. And mm-hmm. I was a little kid. And I will just never forget. I, like, as I've been growing up, I've had this shadow of my cousin and he was only 26 when he died and I was maybe five or six. And I just kept thinking like, you know, how can I honor, you know, Tim's sacrifice? He never got to live, you know, to, to see his children grow up or to be at it. And I just thought, you know what, in that one small way, I'm going to write a thank you letter every single day. <laughs> um, and, you know, and so that's one way I express my gratitude and try and honor um, the life of Tim. And so I just buy postcards and I, when I read about somebody in the newspaper or I hear about something, I just write a postcard and I don't have my return address because it comes without the burden of reciprocity. The right. idea isn't to create a pen pal, but I just want to say thank you to somebody in the world. Wow. And uh, so that's a habit that I do every day. Have those habits then helped you uh, deal with, you know, live with chronic pain? Absolutely, Steve, because I'm always like uh, about three days a week. I am, uh, I have to take such powerful medication that I honestly can't, can't get dressed. I can't even have, uh, air or anything touch my neck. And, um, so on these days when I am, uh, housebound, I don't just like make a couch for it and watch Netflix all day. <laughs> these are the days that I do a lot of reading. And these are the days where I, you know, cultivate that list of people that I'm going to say thank you for. And I thank you too. And often when I'm looking for people to thank, I am just inflated with a sense of gratitude. So um, this habit has really be- has become something that I get a lot out of. Uh, there is no pure altruism because I'm, you know, reading about people who've done great things and uh, like uh, Congressman Elijah Cummings just died this morning. So right. on my list, I'm going to write a letter to his wife and thank you for being a great partner to this amazing man. And so just small things. Um, but I think having a habit of small ways to make your life feel more meaningful helps you feel better about uh, living a somewhat compromised life. I know that stoicism, one of the big techniques is is altering your perspective uh, or, or perhaps it's just stepping away from the fun house mirror that we often look into and, get, and we have a distorted view, but we alter our perspective and, uh, and, and for example, switching from, Oh, I have this problem to, Hey, I still have this to be happy about and I can still contribute in this way and focusing on that rather than uh, I could imagine that someone with, with a, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about is someone with, uh, uh, with chronic pain uh, also has to, has to wor- uh, deal with potential mental health issues from uh, dealing with that chronic pain. Um, Absolutely. And so, um, you know, it's interesting, the English word, you know, pain is rooted in the Latin, uh, porna, which means punishment mm. or penalty. So chronic pain in a way is like serving a life sentence. It's a punishment for a crime you didn't commit. And I think, uh, practicing the stoic virtues, uh, 
gratitude uh, and, you know, uh, just really that has, I, I believe that my strong faith and my uh, belief in Stoic philosophy has really helped me from not falling into a pit of despair mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, you have to miss a lot. I mean, when you, uh, um, when I'm, I'm, you know, stuck inside three days out of seven, sometimes it's longer. Sometimes it has been months. Wow. Um, and, uh, what's interesting about pain is that pain, it no, it, it hurts, but it also destroys language. It's really, when you're in pain, you can barely speak. You're like, it, it, it and, um, it, it can be so overwhelming, um, that, uh, it's in, that there can be some real isolation uh, because you, there are times that you can't speak and um, it's also so difficult to describe. Uh, so I find I am connected to all these incredible entombed minds in my books and in writing letters. And uh, uh, so I feel like I do f- have a connection uh, to the world, even when I'm somewhat out of it what would what advice would you give to someone who is beginning a journey similar to the one you have been on for the last several years so someone's just been diagnosed they're trying to figure out they had big plans you know they were going to be this they were going to do that and now everything's uncertain and they're dealing with uh, some sort of chronic illness chronic pain uh the first thing i would do it would like read philosophy uh and uh most importantly what you uh referred to earlier steve is the fact that uh we all can't do everything but there's something that we can do Mm -hmm. uh mother Teresa said we all can't do great things but we can do small things with great love and i find just being connected to the world um and writing letters i'm a I'm a chaplain at the hospital. Um, just small acts of service. That's, you know, it's in giving that we feel most alive. And um, so, uh, and I would say, like, don't isolate yourself. There's an amazing community with the U.S. Pain Foundation. The amazing thing is that there are 30 million people in the U.S. who live with chronic pain, mm-hmm. chronic intractable pain. Uh, so you're not alone. And, uh, I work as an advocate and I speak to people who are dealing with chronic pain. That's just part of my day or chronic illness. Part of my day Mm -hmm. is just, I've been there and I'm living through it and sharing that. Um, I think one of the great things, um, to know is that, uh, resilience, uh, is often a part of a component of illness, um, And that the most important things is that, you know, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said that hardships prepare ordinary people for extraordinary destiny Hmm. and that um, pain and illness can't take away the things that really matter in life. And that's gratitude, self-respect, resilience. So uh, I would just say reach out to somebody else. And I'm always available through the U.S. Pain Foundation. So if anyone's listening... And uh, I will be your wingman. Well, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, Mm -hmm. Where can folks go uh, if they want to help? Oh, yes. Uh, The Foundation for Sarcoidosis um, Research is fantastic. Um, And uh, they are very grateful for um, any money for research. But also, um, what I really love, Steve, is that um, almost all of – uh, these foundations have pen pal um, hmm. programs, uh, so you can you know reach out and uh, either through email or through um, old uh, U.S. Post. Um, uh, another way is like again, I find meaning in small acts of service, and uh, there's an amazing organization called Foster Care to Success, and they have a mentor program where you mentor a um, a child who has aged out of foster care um, and is in school. And then you mentor them, you know, 
twice a month over Facebook Live. And wow. it's a really very uh, inspiring way to share your time and share your knowledge. That's good for everybody. That would be great for everybody. Be a mentor. I'll, I'll try to uh, put uh, links to all of these uh, in the uh, show description so folks can find those easily. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about the future. Um, what are you, what other projects are you currently involved in that we can look forward to? Well, my um, uh, my newest book, uh, Backbone, um, is coming out in paperback, and okay. that's been a bestseller, Amazon number one bestseller. And my first book, Model Patient, is a New York Times bestseller. Uh, I have a new book um, that I'm working on that'll be out in 2020. Uh, doesn't quite have a title. Okay. Um, one amazing thing is um, uh, because uh, I'm somewhat restricted physically uh, and I have a son, I would hire male babysitters to come and roughhouse with my kid because <laughs> I couldn't. And one of my son's babysitters was going to film school and uh, we have a we and we really he became a part of the family and uh, we have a, a, a film production company and we made a short documentary it's called the greatest beer run ever um it's on youtube okay. and it's an amazing story uh that uh, uh my friend andrew and i were at a party and we were talking to a journalist and andrew asked a great question he said what is the greatest story that you never reported on and she told us the story which we tell in the greatest beer run ever is that this guy, Chicky Donahue, in 1967, had served uh, in the U.S. Army. And when he got back uh, to the Inwood section of, Brook of uh, Manhattan, his four best friends that were all 18 to about 21 had all been drafted. And he just kept saying, you know, all I wanted when I was in Vietnam was an ice-cold Pabst Blue Ribbon. Hmm. And... Uh, he one night was in his cups and said, I'm going to go back and I'm going to go, I'm going to bring some beer to our boys. So he filled a duffel bag with a with Pabst Blue Ribbon and got on a munition ship and went to Vietnam and found all four of his best friends and then got stuck during the Tet Offensive. Oh my. So it's a beautiful story about valor and courage and how far you go for a friend. And uh, the amazing thing is uh, my buddy Pete Farrelly, who directed Dumb and Dumber, uh, uh, right after his new movie was out called Green Book, mm -hmm. he was like, Duff, you haven't been returning my calls. And I was like, what's up? And he said, hey, I saw that doc that you did, and uh, I'm going to turn it into my next feature. Whoa. So uh, actually, next in November, we start pre-production on The Greatest Beer Run Ever, uh, with Peter Farrelly directing, wow. which is going to be amazing. And that will be out probably in about 2021. Okay, excellent. Well, we'll look forward to that. Um, yeah, you know what? One of the things is like, you know, like when you've had a great experience in life and somebody's really, it, Peter Farrelly was a, a, a huge inspiration seeing him. Uh, you know, Pete used to sell round uh, uh, beach towels in california so you didn't have to get up and move your body around the sun oh, like yeah. that's what he was doing when to raise money to do dumb and dumber his first <laughs> film and uh i just always admired his spirit and the fact that he got things done and you know i let him know how much i admired him we became really good friends he when he had uh when, it, when the movie was made he gave me a part so i think a, a really important thing is like you know have mentors and also stay in touch with them. Like take those steps to let them let people know that you're thinking about them. Excellent advice. Well, Duff, I really appreciate you joining the podcast today. Thank you, Steve. I'm in awe of all the things you do. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And I look forward to seeing you um, at the next Stoic Gathering. Oh, I look forward to it as well. Hey, and thank you for all you do with sharing the knowledge with uh, your podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to The Sunday Stoic. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review The Sunday Stoic on iTunes. 
Become a member of the Sunday Stoic team, earn rewards, and be an integral part of the show by becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash sundaystoic. Contact the show by emailing sundaystoic at gmail.com or by leaving a voicemail at 501-503-3132. To find out more, visit www.sundaystoicpodcast.com. And as Steve always says, carpe diem. Thank you.